Despite having recently returned to town, Russell crept up to his wife's bed in the middle of the night, determined not to forget to celebrate their anniversary with flowers. As he approached, the curtain dividing them rustled, but he heard strange noises rather than the joyful reunion he had imagined. He heard his wife cry out in that familiar, pleasurable voice, the same one she used to make love to him. Opening the curtain, he saw something that well beyond his expectations. Another man appeared to be receiving encouragement from his wife, who was very involved with him. Russell cried out, Ginger, what in the world is happening here? In shock and wrath, Who are you? Leave my room right now, his wife snapped back. She then turned to face her partner and pleaded, Go on, darling. An older woman with a cane attacked Russell from behind before he could react. A nurse hurried in amid the bustle and mayhem disarming the woman and giving her comfort before drawing the curtain to keep his wife and her partner alone. Russell begged, why aren't you stopping them? My wife is being taken advantage of as the nurse led him away. Calmly, the nurse said, Mr. Compton, your wife is not being forced. She is engaging willingly, but she has dementia. She can't consent. You have to stop her. I'll take legal action against this nursing home. That's within your rights. However, when you were briefed upon admission, you agreed to terms acknowledging that individuals with dementia might not recognize their spouses and are free to form connections within the facility as long as it's consensual and agreeable to both parties. Russell said, connections? They were, before becoming irritated, and that's their decision. I understand this is difficult, but your wife's mind is in a different reality. To her, this might be an expression of love towards you. This is sadly a facet of the illness, the nurse said with compassion. I understand what she's going through. What I can't fathom is how you allow this to continue, said Russell. I apologize, Mr. Compton, but I'm unable to delve into this as thoroughly as you require. Our staffing shortages during second and third shifts often limit the time we have. Please go home for now. Try to calm yourself and return tomorrow. Abby, the social worker, can address your concerns more adequately. I assure you, things might not be as dire as they seem. With that, she dashed toward the closest nurse's illumination. Russell, tears running down his cheeks, left the building. He felt a wave of regret for putting his wife in a nursing home. He wondered fervently if there was any chance of getting her back home, sitting in his car in the facility's parking lot, seeking direction. He thought back to a chat he'd had with Wally, his Vietnam War buddy whose Vietnam War buddy whose wife was in a nursing home and had dementia. Ginger's illness hadn't been as bad back then, and Russell hadn't really listened to Wally's counsel. To him, Forgetting was then just another aspect of growing older. Russell saw Wally where they usually hang out in the VBU and offered to buy him a drink. Wally laughed. Must be something real big or real bad for you to buy me a drink. Russell opened up sobbing. I need your help, buddy. I just left Ginger at the nursing home. She, she was involved with someone else. And they wouldn't intervene. Wally put a consoling hand on Russell's shoulder and said, I get it. Hurts like hell. These know it. All types think cheating doesn't matter. It's all about that. If it feels good garbage, probably just to keep the patients occupied and hassle. Free for the staff. Nursing homes. Biggest scam there is. What can I do? I promised her I'd never put her in a nursing home, but I can't manage her at home anymore. When we last talked, you seem to be handling it. What changed? It became impossible. She was up all hours trying to leave. I couldn't leave her alone. Had to take her everywhere. Once the cops found her walking the streets at 2 a.m., I installed alarms and motion detectors, but it didn't give me a decent night's sleep. She wore me out, and I had a mild heart attack due to stress. I had to place her in a nursing home temporarily for what they call respite, while I stayed in the hospital. When I got out, 
I realized they were better equipped to care for her than I could ever be. I just couldn't find the motivation to bring her back home. I don't have the energy anymore. It was heartbreaking, but taking her home would have been the end of me. Did you consider hiring help? I tried a few times. It was tough finding someone, and when I did, the cost was so high, I could only manage it occasionally. And really, well, she's caught up with her own family. Is David still deployed in Afghanistan? Yeah. I try not to bother him. He's got his hands full, just trying to stay safe. Ginger's behavior sounds a lot like my Alice's. May she rest in peace. Listen, I'll share something you might not like, but please consider it. Is your wife on Aricept or Namenda? Yeah, she is. Why? What do you think those medications do? Well, they don't cure dementia. They slow down its progress. Why? What do you mean, why? Why prolong the disease? There's no cure. It only extends the suffering for both of you. My suggestion? Consider taking her off the meds. It might shorten her misery by a couple of years and give you several more. Russell had never thought about it like that. I don't know. I just want us together as long as possible. Think about this. Is the person she is now who you want to be with watching her deteriorate. Consider what's best for both of you. But new drugs are being discovered all the time that might help her. They're finding drugs that might halt dementia's progression, not reverse it. She's lost too many brain cells to recover. Would you want her to stay mentally where she is right now for the rest of your life? Russell uttered a sarcastic thanks for the uplifting chat. I wouldn't be doing my duty as your friend if I didn't give you honest advice. Unfortunately, there's no perfect solution to the questions you're grappling with. I'm sorry. Here's more advice that might offer some help. Attend the Alzheimer's Support Group. It usually meets every second Tuesday of the month at the Area Agency on Aging on Fairview Drive, starting at 10, 0 in the morning. It's a place where family members gather and share experiences dealing with relatives facing dementia. Sometimes, they bring in speakers discussing programs related to transportation, in home assistance, and medical equipment. It might be worth looking into. Russell wasn't sure if his feelings had improved or worsened after speaking with Wally. He looked forward to his meeting with the social worker with dread. Still, a drink of bourbon and mental tiredness made for an unusually peaceful night's sleep. His mood did not improve after waiting for Abby to meet him for more than 30 minutes. Russell approached her as soon as she was seated at her desk and said, Tell me why I should accept my wife being involved with another man? Abby stayed calm, unmoved by the altercation. Mr. Compton, I can't claim to understand exactly how you feel. Nothing quite like this has happened to me. I do understand it pains you to witness your wife in such a situation. Allow me to clarify our standpoint. When a person has Alzheimer's, she started. She has dementia, not Alzheimer's, Russell chimed in. That's a common misconception. Alzheimer's is actually a type of dementia. It's the most prevalent form. There are several other types, but the common thread among them is memory loss. Abby continued, there's a range of symptoms that may or may not accompany the disease. Some may wander, others might not. Personalities might change for some, not for others. Each case is unique. What remains constant is memory loss, gradual cognitive decline, and ultimately organ failure. This is how I understand what's happened to your wife's mind. She's been thrown into a broken time machine that allows her to go back in time, but cannot go forward. As a result, she can remember events from years ago with great detail, but may find it difficult to recall things that happened recently, such as what she ate for breakfast or even if she ate at all. We have to go into her previous time, whenever that may be, because she is unable to return to our present. We want her to savor and cherish that moment when the machine has stopped. That's why we talk about the good old days. Do things that are associated with that time period, and occasionally we lie to her about visiting home or seeing loved ones who have passed away since those memories are vivid. 
Our intention is to deliver satisfying experiences. They may not remember our conversations, but they appear to remember both happy and sad feelings. People's actions stem from their perception. Alzheimer's skews her view of the real world, so she behaves according to her past reality, not our current one. Unfortunately, Ginger sees her relationship as fitting for that time. We can't alter her perception to align with ours. All we can do is strive to make each day as pleasant as possible for her here. So, as long as it makes Ginger happy, it's okay for her to be unfaithful. Abby took a moment to gather herself. Our policy dictates that residents can choose their companions as long as it's their choice, unless they're guardian objects. According to our records, you're not her legal guardian. I'm her husband for crying out loud. Doesn't that count for anything in deciding who she's with? Technically, no. Just as if she didn't have dementia, being her husband wouldn't prevent her from pursuing a relationship if she chose to. I'm not suggesting she would. If she had an affair, besides being upset, you probably try to understand her reasons before taking action. That's what's needed now. Her motives have nothing to do with betraying you. I urge you to read the materials we provided. It'll help you comprehend. So, you're fine taking my money for her care, but you don't think I should have a say in who she's with? You seem distressed, Mr. Compton. If this is too upsetting, I'm happy to have the administrator explain further. Or, you always have the option to find a different place for her. In silence, Russell tried to make sense of what he'd heard and the suggestion that moving her was a threat. Recollections of the earlier moments when he and Ginger had trouble communicating returned. I'm sorry for getting angry, but accepting this feels impossible. Unfortunately, yes. To improve things for both you and her, you'll need to adapt your approach in interacting with your wife. We follow the best friend's approach as our training model. Trust me, mastering it will make a significant difference. I strongly recommend attending the Alzheimer's support group. They can provide invaluable guidance. I know about it. Second Tuesdays at the Area Agency on Aging, a friend mentioned it too. Great. Also, feel free to ask me or the staff about our approach with her or our actions at any time. It's completely understandable why you're upset. That's not to say we don't make mistakes, but we're doing our utmost. Russell had intended to meet his wife after leaving Abby's office, but seeing her with someone else made it too difficult. Thanks, he said silently, for nothing. Instead, he made his way home. As soon as he entered, the phone rang. It was really the daughter of Russell and Ginger. Hey, Dad, how's Mom? Russell felt a tinge of annoyance. She had never asked how he was before. He made an effort to control his annoyance. Russell couldn't help but make a sarcastic remark. She seems to be settling into the nursing home. She's made at least one close friend. Russell knew really didn't know the reality. That's good. I understand why she had to go while you were in the hospital, but I'm not sure why you didn't bring her home after you recovered. Perceiving it as a challenge to his wife's devotion Russell felt challenged. You don't understand why, because you don't know what it's like to care for her. Take her in for a couple of weeks, and then criticize my decision. No need to get defensive. We visited a few months back, and she didn't seem too bad. Yeah, you spent, what, five hours with her? Talked about the past? Did you try giving her a bath when she refused? Stayed up at midnight to stop her from leaving the house? answered the same question ten times in an hour? Well, there must be some government program that could assist you. You managed fine on your own until your heart attack. Russell tried an alternative strategy. Really, you're all about progressiveness and women's liberation. Didn't you once say a housewife's job should be valued more? That it's as demanding, if not more? than a regular full-time job, starting before breakfast and lasting after dinner? Yeah, but what's that got to do with? Who do you think is doing the more than 
full-time job your mother did for nearly 50 years? Me? And who's handling my usual job? Me? Who's taking on the extra responsibility of caring for someone with dementia? Me? If you want to take over any of my roles, be my guest. Name one program that could help me. Easy, Dad. I have my own family to care for now. Teens demand a lot of energy. I'd like to help, but I can't. You're her husband, after all. Russell experienced a brief moment of concern, thinking he would set off another heart attack. I'm well aware I'm her husband. And are you aware you're her child? Let's see. How many years did your mother and I care for you, support you, nurse you, heal your hurts, buy you a car, and send you to college? 22 years? And how many days have you paid us back? Hardly any, you ungrateful. He put the phone down and checked his blood tension. He almost instantly pulled the phone by its cable and took it out of the socket when it rang again. Anticipating additional calls, he turned off his smartphone. He didn't feel like apologizing right then, even though he knew it might be important later. He studied the suggested readings over the next few days. There was no celebration of their anniversary. Ginger didn't think it was because she didn't acknowledge him as her spouse. He tried a few times without success before asking the on-duty nurse for advice. She said, you don't resemble how Russell looked to her during the time she's living in her mind. You're too old to fit that image. Maybe try telling her you're someone else. Someone older who was close to both of you 20, 30 years ago and see if that helps. I suppose it's worth a shot. I'm not getting anywhere right now. Ginger was found in the lounge, lost in thought when Russell went to her ward. Hello, Ginger. How are you? Who are you? What do you want? Don't you remember me? Well, you kind of look like my Russell's father. That's right. I'm Carl, Russell's father. Ginger smiled broadly. Carl, it's so good to see you. How's Mildred? She's doing fine, thank you. She would come, but she's busy baking for a church meal. I'm sure she'll visit soon. With a grin. When's that lazy son of yours? and my husband coming to get me out of this place. I just saw Russell a bit ago. He said he'd be here after work. Sometimes, I think he loves his job more than me. It was hard for Russell to control his feelings. Now, Ginger, you know that's not true. I know for a fact that Russell loves you dearly. After a moment, Ginger said, Yes, I know. I've always known that. When is Russell coming to take me home? She said, as soon as he finishes work, he better. I have to go now. I'll come back soon. Thank you. Bring some chocolate next time, please. Russell's talk with his wife left him feeling torn. He lamented her state, but took comfort in their conversation and how happy she appeared to be in contrast to their previous interactions. Even though he was nervous about telling people about his experience, he looked forward to the support group meeting the next day. In a small conference room, the Alzheimer's support group was seated about a dozen people at an oval table. Upon arriving, attendees signed an attendance form and were given coffee and pastries. The meeting was facilitated by the empathetic African-American social worker, Belinda. She had Russell sign a confidentiality agreement to protect his privacy outside of the meeting and asked him to fill out another form with personal information. At Russell's request, Wally went with him and told him everything was routine. Belinda started by laying out the meeting's ground rules. Respectful discussion was stressed. Speaking was encouraged but not required. And confidentiality was of utmost importance. Before continuing, she invited questions. Russell, it's customary for newcomers to share their caregiving situation but there's no pressure to do so. Others will briefly summarize theirs. Would you like to start or hear from others first? Belinda put forth. Russell answered, I'd prefer to wait. Feeling a little nervous, spouses, adult children, and even a granddaughter all related their experiences, providing care for others around the table. While the other half had relatives in nursing homes, the other half took care of loved ones at home. 
Among the group were two sisters who shared caregiving duties for their mother and a woman whose husband had recently died. Hearing their stories made Russell feel more comfortable. Throughout the conversation, Russell was the subject of several questions. Had he protected assets from Medicaid? Were family members available to help? Was he making use of senior care programs? How was he protecting his own well-being? Russell sought advice after realizing there were factors he had overlooked. Everyone agreed with Belinda when she suggested getting in touch with the Aging and Disability Resource Center, which has an extensive database for elderly people and caregivers. She gave Russell their contact information and a link to a website where he could learn more about the illness and how to take care of himself. The participants' stories ranged in tone from moving to funny, giving Russell a sense of community despite his struggles. The support group urged him to make amends with his daughter, recognizing her good intentions in spite of her ignorance about the illness and the associated care issues. Russell was uncomfortable about that, but he agreed to give it some thought. Russell learned more about Alzheimer's and improved his communication skills with his wife over time. He came up with a novel way to handle Ginger's relationships with other men. After making arrangements with the night staff, Russell would darken the room and come to Ginger's bedside every evening at 8 o'clock. He would have applied the same scent that he had worn when they first started dating. His voice remained the same, making Ginger think it was him, even with the lights off, taking her back to when they were first together. They spent intimate moments in the dark, just the two of them, remembering their first marriage and her joy. Ginger liked the act of intimate foreplay that resulted from massaging her skin with lotion. When lubricants were required, he used caution to attend to her demands. Russell even began taking prescription medications to ensure he could participate in their private moments. With the possible exception of the old neighbor woman wagging her cane from time to time, he confessed that their current state of passion was among their best during their marriage. Russell usually left well in advance of the start of the morning shift. Russell came to the conclusion that there were benefits and drawbacks to Alzheimer's memory loss in terms of day-to-day -day interactions. He knew that Ginger wouldn't remember much, he said, but it also meant that she would rapidly forget his blunders, which would free him up to try again without the burden of past failures. Russell complied with instructions and put together an old photo album, saying he did not remember the people in it. Based on her memory gaps, Ginger was happy to identify them, which helped him determine where her mind was at. The fact that the music still seemed new to her every time he listened to it gave him comfort. When he wanted some diversity, he checked out a book on activities designed specifically for people with dementia to keep things interesting. Russell and Ginger's age group friends helped plan fun events, especially those that involved music. They put together CDs containing songs from Ginger's identifiable era to counteract her loneliness, to which she gladly belted out the lyrics. Russell was astounded by her capacity to remember song lyrics and discovered that her illness had less of an impact on her music memory than other memory regions. Talks veered away from current issues and toward historical occurrences from the age that Ginger's mind was living in. In order to prevent disturbing or confusing the residents, TVs in the nursing home seldom ever broadcast news channels. Rather, they switched to channels that broadcast vintage black and white television, which became well-liked. Because of her short-term memory lapses, Ginger asked the same questions over and over again, and Russell learned to react to her questions as though they were the first. When she talked about seeing dead people from her past, Russell didn't say anything wrong. He made eye contact with her and inquired about those people to ease her memories. But it was still difficult for Russell when Ginger begged sobbing to go home. Not to their shared house, but to her long-gone childhood home. He would comfort her, bring up some unfinished business, quickly get her to focus on something else. Russell discovered one day that Ginger's room's full-length mirror was missing from the door while using the restroom. When staff members explained why it was taken down, they cited Ginger's misguided notion that an old woman was hiding in her restroom every time she looked in the mirror. 
they decided to remove the mirror since Ginger was not happy with how she looked. Every now and then, Ginger would imagine the most unlikely of situations, like the day she cried out in alarm that she had to run outside to meet David and Reilly as they got off the school bus. Russell replied quickly, Oh, Ginger, I forgot to tell you. The Wilsons asked if Reilly could go home with them after school today to play with their kids. I'm sorry I forgot to tell you, Ginger shot back. That bugger he should have told me. Fortunately, Russell was spared the upsetting experiences related by certain members of the support group, such as the sister's mother, accusing them of stealing and throwing wild parties at her house. It was extremely terrible to watch such behavior, even when it was explained by the illness, especially when it included your own mother. Russell became a go to resource for people attempting to retain their loved ones at home as he took action over time to shield his house from Medicaid. Most importantly, he also gave self-care, both mental and physical. First priority, Ginger's communication decreased and her demand for physical assistance grew as her condition worsened. She seemed to find comfort in Russell's presence, even though she could not recognize him anymore. Russell was by her side when she died one night, despite their private times had long since ended. However, Russell thought that sleeping together made their shared sleep better. Months previously, Riley and her father had made up, and she had educated herself about the illness and its aftercare. She visited her parents more often, and even took on the job of caregiver for a week at their house after apologizing profusely. She was worn out from the event and apologized profusely, even though Russell had given her advice. Riley also talked to her brother about end-of-life issues after this experience provided her the confidence to do so. The family was delighted by his unexpected bonus of coming home with his new fiancé. Russell realized he was past the point where he needed to find another partner in order to survive after years of caring for Ginger. Rather, he was excited to make the most of his remaining years and cherish the happy recollections of his last year together. One widowed support group participant kept him company as she understood his journey as a caregiver. Their bond was based on similar circumstances and Russell made sure they spent time together without a cane. Russell was very grateful that he was not sucked into a malfunctioning time machine full of regrets and irreversible previous experiences.